So I had never heard of this one, maybe you have. It's the oldest world government organization in history, at least of anything modern. Of course, there's been empires that want to take over the world for millennia, but this little-known organization is the oldest of the modern world government groups more than half a century older than the United Nations and decades older than the League of Nations, there was the Interparliamentary Union, and it's actually still around. In an age when we can go to any spot on Earth within a matter of hours, modern transportation may be used to carry understanding and friendship to all nations. Melissa found this one while we were digging around researching some Bilderberg stuff, and it's here in this article by, uh, of all people, Edith Kermit Roosevelt, who's the granddaughter of President Teddy Roosevelt, and she wrote a lot of articles calling out the attack on national sovereignty and the quest for world government, <laughs> despite the involvement of her family and all kinds of things, including lots of CIA and uh, Voice of America stuff. She writes, while the United Nations may get the headlines, another world government group, the Interparliamentary Union, has been maneuvering quietly behind the scenes for decades to create a world parliament through its core of trained world government legislatures. And she writes that this group has announced the goal to unite all members of all parliaments across the entire world to promote, quote, peace and cooperation, particularly by means of universal organization. And this IPU group has aimed to get all governments of the world involved, whether they're democratic in nature or not. It means that modern communications may be used to establish a friendly world community. And this interparliamentary union is headquartered in Geneva, Switzerland. It's put together by a British guy named Sir William Randolph Kramer and by a French politician, Frederick Passy. And then it was assisted by the fortune of Andrew Carnegie, who helped to finance the group from the earliest years. So 25 years before the start of World War I and the creation of the League of Nations, in the wake of that, they were already moving in this direction pretty rapidly. This interparliamentary union group has not just been talk, they were the ones who were responsible for setting up the global arbitration, the permanent court of arbitration in The Hague, back in 1899, before the century even turned, and still 15 years before World War I started. Back in Paris in 1889, started with nine governments, but by the time this article was written in 1962, it had 64 governments, and today it has 178 member parliaments from the governments around the world, so pretty much almost everybody. And basically, like other world government groups, they include people from all the world governments, but they're appointed officials. There's no vote that people of the world get towards who's on this conference and what they do. It just consists of the people from these different nations. This means that all the people of the world are neighbors with new relationships, new benefits, and new responsibilities. And Edith Roosevelt points out that the laws adopted by the group itself state that every senator and representative in the Congress of the United States is ipso facto a member of the group. So all of Congress is part of this group and at least knows about it, whether they support it or not. But again, they're not elected to that body. They're just part of it. And there are other appointed officials from the U.S. and from all the other member countries. And it's interesting because Ms. Roosevelt gets into all the other groups who are involved with steering the agenda of this interparliamentary union and other groups that are interlocked with it. And among the people she names just from the American side of things who've either been part of the IPU or helped to shape its agenda are people from within the U.S. who've been very much pushing for world government. The first one she names is an attendee of Bilderberg, Senator Alexander Wiley, who apparently went to the 57 conference, and and Senators Paul Douglas and John Sparkman, who themselves sponsored resolutions in the Senate to further develop the United Nations into a world federation, whereas other respective senators, Senators Kefauver and the much better known Senator Fulbright, uh, for whom the scholarship is named and, and who was also a mentor of Bill Clinton, they pushed for a resolution to get the quote-unquote democracies of the entire North Atlantic Pact to name delegates to a federal convention for a federal union, not federal of the United States of America, but of a united group of the various countries in Europe and the United States, probably also Canada, and anyone else who falls under the North Atlantic Pact. 
Edith Roosevelt writes that like other international organizations, the IPU conferences have become what is called a forum for constructive East-West dialogues on the problems dividing the world, and that these East-West dialogues serve to implement Vladimir Lenin's proposal for United States of the World uh, that I guess he proposed back in 1915 or around that time, and that the Interparliamentary Union has passed resolutions calling for, first of all, limits of state sovereignty. That dates back to the 1952 meeting of the IPU. It's called for the establishment of a permanent international police force under the aegis of the UN to ensure collective security. That dates back to the 1958 meetings. It's introduced a resolution calling for the adoption of a plan to remove obstacles to world trade. Of course, they've come a long way on that already, and that a lot of this would be organized under the World Bank and the related structures that were created towards the end of World War II, but of course, before the war ended. International trade makes it possible for the varied products of every land to be enjoyed by all. The contents of your pantry or the materials in your home may come from scores of distant nations. And this interparliamentary union that practically no one has ever heard of is also part of and interlocks with the United Nations. And of course, like the United Nations and other world government and global institutions, the IPU still today, still around, is promoting issues like gender equality, human rights, sustainable development, global governance, and peace and security programs for the youth, and a promotion of democracy around the world. Yeah. All talking points we've heard before, but the point is there's a far-reaching agenda. It stretches across many agencies, many of these agencies that people have hardly ever heard of. And according to Roosevelt, the Interparliamentary Union, which is coming up on 130 years of existence and 130 years of a coordinated, documented plan amongst the wealthy and elite of the world to put together a global structure, has been working with not only the United Nations, but with the Council of Europe, the OAS, the Organization of America states. It's been working with the Atlantic Council, the American Peace Society, the European Parliamentary Assembly. It's been working with NATO's parliament. It's been working with the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association, with the East-West Roundtable Conferences, which itself is very Royal Institute of International Affairs. It's been working with the separate United Nations Association, with the United World Federalist, with the World Association of Parliamentarians, for world government, also known as WAPWIG. And these groups are not only working towards world government, global governance, and globalization in general, but at least according to Roosevelt and many other conservatives of the time, they had a master plan that worked towards having appointed potentates over the world, key international financiers, and what she calls Marxist, working together for the world government. And that, just for example, this World Association for Parliamentarians for World Government, WAPWIG, passed uh, planks of this plan in 1952 with the help of this IPU organization, and that they were trying to bring to power a world parliament body that would have appointed members from respective governments appointed appointed members for the promotion of democracy around the world, of course, and that these appointed members would be drawn from the population statistics of the various countries. So Asia, for instance, would have a lot more people than the U.S. or other, you know, moderately populated parts of the world, and that they aim to set up a world director, eight zone directors, and 51 regional directors, very close to the other plans for world government that have come out, and that these potentates, these appointed parliamentarians, Parliamentary members who would oversee the regions and the zones of the world would not reign over the lands that they were from, but that these appointed potentates would rule over the opposite land. And so that specifically, for example, the southern and southwest United States would be occupied by Soviet Russian troops. I don't know how many times we've heard that conspiracy. Lots of people warning that it's going to happen, warning that it could happen, watching for them, pointing out training exercises with Russian troops, cooperating with the U.S. on American soil. This plan goes back for a long way, and it's been documented at least in the conversations of the press, if not by the documents themselves from these world body organizations. 
It's not just the Interparliamentary Union, of course. The United Nations has eclipsed it. Before that, they were putting most of their eggs in the basket of the League of Nations. But I guess the point is, there's at least a dozen or so of these world government organizations, world parliamentary, various regional organizations that have all been working towards this and are sharing a common goal <laughs> to circumvent the sovereignty of nations. And of course, the people of this country have been very proud of our democratic constitutional republic and all the rights that it recognizes and pretends to protect, while at the same time, through the back door and through the end run around sovereignty, so many of the pieces are being handed off to international groups, which even if they were well-meaning, or even if they are well-meaning, are not duly elected, they're not accountable to people, they're certainly not democratic, and really they're not even known in general. There are people ruling over us and making decisions, at least in policy, that are affecting the United States and pretty much all the countries of the world, and there's very little, if any, public dialogue about it, and very little, if any, accountability that the citizens of the world can exercise over a body that pretends to represent everyone, everyone of the entire world. It is within the power of all of us to bring about a better way of life for people of all races and nationalities. Our goal must be mutual trust, mutual understanding, mutual respect, so that our most distant friends will know how to live with us and we with them in one family of nations on this shrinking world. I just thought that was interesting. It's kind of a quick piece. Uh, we're working on a lot more stuff. We're in the later stages of our film, really trying to get it done. Uh, <laughs> it's just kind of killing us, though. Um, and the Bilderberg Conference is coming up, so I'm going to try to do more coverage on that as well. So stay tuned, and thanks for everyone who's been watching and supporting. Take care.